Good Monday, September 14th. It's coming up to the middle of September already. It's already midterm. How do you like my blue shirt and this kind of contrasting orange mask I have to wear? Well, nobody's here, so I ain't wearing a mask. I'll just talk to you like this. This is the last installment of Chapter 1 Lecture, or we call this, I think, maybe Lecture 3. I can't remember, Lecture 2 or 3. And this is an overview of some things we're going to look at in geology going forward. So I'm going to maximize the show here. And I wonder if I can even pull out a pointer option, which we'll go ahead and use. Ooh, should I use a pen, a highlighter, or a laser? Highlighter. Ooh, that's, I'll just use a pen. Okay. Uh, we ended up talking about the three different parts of the earth, uh, the core, uh, the inner core, really kind of two, almost two parts, the mantle and the, and then the crust. And we said the crust kind of has these three areas, which is the lithosphere, the stenosphere, which is really kind of the top of the mantle. And then uh, the crust comes in two parts, the oceanic crust and the continental crust. And, and like I said, the core is iron and nickel. Uh, the outer part's liquid. The inner part is solid. So moving ahead, now we look at rocks. We can break rocks into three groups. Most of you guys know this. We had this the very first day in class. Um, we have uh, igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks. We could walk down the river and we could find all of these. And actually later in the year, I have you do a survey to see which one of these is the greatest percentage of the gravel in the river. And as we talk about it, it might make sense that which one do you think is going to be the most common in the river? Is it going to be igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, or sedimentary in terms of the gravel? Okay. And when, when going ahead, you might have an idea of why it would be the way it is. So the rock cycle is kind of the foundation of a lot of earth science stuff. And uh, we'll go through the little chart here in a second. Where is the chart? Usually there's a chart. Meh, we'll go back to the chart. It'll show up in a second. But anyway, uh, here we got some pictures. Uh, I'm not going to blow it up, but here's an igneous flow in uh, northern Arizona that came out of a, a cinder cone crater. Uh, so it means it's relatively new in terms of the Earth's age. Uh, it formed when you had magma come to the surface, and now it runs out as a lava flow. It looks like it's pretty dark, so it's probably fairly high in iron and magnesium and not that high in silica, so it's not very explosive. Uh, here we're looking at a big giant chunk of cross pitted sandstone. It looks like the Morrison Formation, which is real common down in the southwest part of the United States. And how do I know it's sedimentary? Well, you can see these real classic, we call cross beds in there, and that is indicative of being deposited in a like a sand dune environment or an environment where the water is moving. In this case, the Morrison, these are giant sand dunes that formed in the middle of uh, an ancient continent, which has now been. Uh, solidified, lithified, and uplifted in parts of like New Mexico and Utah and Arizona. This one right here is in Utah. Uh, it's called the Navajo Sandstone. Uh, metamorphic rock tends to be the oldest stuff, or not the oldest. It can be pretty old, but it's really durable. Uh, here we got a picture of the Vishnu Schist, which is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Uh, it tends to be the basement rock of most continents because it's been exposed to uh, lots of pressure, so all the different parts of the rock have been solidified and the crystals have been uh, basically almost like welded together. So metamorphic rock tends to be the hardest and sedimentary rock tends to be the softest, not always. And igneous rock is kind of the in-between. Um, and the rock cycle, you could have any one of these phases at different times. So igneous rocks, according to the rock cycle, uh, what you have there is cooling and solidification of molten rock, lava, or magma. Then it crystallizes and forms an igneous rock. So it's part of a volcanic process. Um, sedimentary rocks, anything can form a sedimentary rock. An igneous rock can be, sedi uh, can be weathered and form an, a sedimentary rock if, if the sediments are stratified, and lithified, and cemented together. Um, and the key with sedimentation or sedimentary rocks to get it like it says here, the key word is lithify. In other words, it has to form layers that are welded together. Usually in the case around here, it's going to be a calcium carbonate cement or it's going to be like a, a silica cement. And that's going to basically hold the rocks. How does that work? Well, by heat and pressure, 
the water in the ground basically helps dissolve some of the minerals in the rock and then eventually forms like a glue. We covered that stuff in earth science too. Metamorphic rocks, we have a couple different, several different types of metamorphism. Now basically, you can take an igneous rock or a metamorphic rock or even a sedimentary rock and metamorphic mores uh, make it more dense and more compact by adding pressure and in some cases heat or both. And uh, you, can, you can have both or one or the other. Here, of course, is a picture of the rock cycle. Um, generally, I actually have you guys go out and, and draw this and see what you remember about it. Uh, you can see it's a lot more in depth. And, you know, we start all this stuff off in uh, grade school. You should have maybe had some of this in grade school, maybe third grade. The rock cycle is a pretty common thing with younger kids. You have the igneous and the sedimentary and the, and, and the metamorphic rocks. And basically, it shows how you can go from one to the next. Um, here, uh, they're showing magma in the Earth's surface, below the surface or at the surface. It cools, crystallizes, forms igneous rock. Uh, if it weathers away and then forms sediment, it gets transported. Um, then eventually, it gets lithified down here into sedimentary rock. Now, if the sedimentary rock keeps getting deposited on top of by more and more and more different layers, now all of a sudden, you've got pressure and it starts deforming that rock and it forms metamorphic rock. You can also have metamorphic rock form on the edge of magma chambers, which we call contact metamorphism. But you can see all these different pathways that occur within the uh, rock cycle. So it's a fairly dy dynamic process. And uh, you can have a metamorphic rock turn around and be another metamorphic rock through more metamorphism. You can have an igneous rock remelt and form an igneous rock again. You can have a sedimentary rock weather and get redeposited. So it's not just from one to the other. It's a fairly complex network of things there. Uh, the face of the earth, basically, if we take the earth, we, we, we have kind of two situations here. We have ocean basins, we have continents. And obviously the elevation difference is a result of the relative density and thickness. Uh, okay, generally what we're talking about there um, the more dense the rock, the more dense rock tends to be in the ocean basins because it's made of higher density basalt type rock. The crust is thinner there, but where you have the continents, your thickest parts of the continents actually have the least dense rock uh, because it's high in silica. Silica is a much lighter molecule or a silicate is a much lighter molecule than an iron silicate magnesium which is basically basalt is iron and magnesium. So it's like if you compare like a cast iron uh, skillet on the stove to an aluminum one on the stove, well, your feldspars are aluminums and your, uh, well, they have aluminum in them and silicon oxygen where your basalts have like iron and magnesium. Well, just pick up those two different pots and you'll see that the, the cast iron one's way heavier and that's kind of what we're looking at with ocean basins. They, they, have, they have more iron and magnesium in it where the, where the continents have less. And as a result, um, what happens is the continents have a, are actually thicker too. So they tend to float on top of almost that, that, that more dense mantle rock below. Continents have, uh, can be mainly composed of granite rocks or granodiorite rocks. And they can be up to 35, or average 35 kilometers thick. They can be thicker where you have big mountain ranges like the Himalayas and the Rockies and the Alps and things like that. Where if we look at the ocean basins, um, ocean basins, ocean depth on average is about 3.8 kilometers. Uh, and of course, it's composed of just maybe on, on average seven kilometer basalt rocks. So you can see the thickness of the continental crust is five times thicker than the than the oceanic crust. And those are things we'll cover more in plate tectonic stuff too. So if we look at the edge of continents in continents themselves, uh, what we have here, continental margin is basically the edge of the of the the continental land masses. And then you have a continental shelf that comes off of there and then a slope, which is a steep drop off down to the abyss of the ocean. Um, like it says here, the, uh, the continental shelf is gently sloping, right? And, uh, and of course, that extends in different um, 
different amounts in different parts of continents, depending on the, the, the direction of the travel of the continent in terms of the plate tectonic situation there. Um, but typically what you have to know the difference between the two is the shelf tends to be kind of a gentle, uh, a gentle, gradual uh, slope down to the abyss, abyss of the ocean. We see that more on the Atlantic side of North America, uh, where the continental slope tends to be a real steep drop off that goes to really deep ocean floors. And we see that more on the Pacific side of the ocean. Not saying there isn't a continental slope in the Atlantic, it just tends to be out there further from the shore. Whereas if we're out in Washington, Oregon, that continental slope is not too far off the coast. And the reason is, is our continent is actually moving in the direction towards the Pacific and it's actually moving away from the Atlantic. Uh, the continental rise, like it says here, consists of a thick wedge of sediment that moves downward from the continental shelf. So what they're basically saying is, as you get away from the continent, you've got this thick band wedge of sediment that's basically eroding off of the continent. So this is what they're talking about with the continental rise. And we don't get too much into that in this class. That's more of an oceanography thing, really. Uh, the deep oceans, of course, the oceans in some cases are, I think on average, the ocean depth is like 26,000 feet. You can check me out on Google, but I think the average ocean depth on Earth is, is somewhere in that neighborhood of 20, 26,000. And the very deepest parts of the oceans, we actually have, we have, we call those trenches. Those tend to be areas where you have subduction between plates. But for the most part, uh, a lot of the ocean is a big, fat, flat, not fat, big, flat plain called the abyssal plain. Uh, from time to time, though, if you look at oceanic maps, uh, we have these really kind of interesting seamounts. And one seamount in particular that we're going to look at is the one that makes up uh, the islands of Hawaii. And that seamount chain uh, helps us date uh, the Pacific Plate is actually pretty interesting, you know, or the movement of the Pacific Plate. So we use seamounts to help us track uh, plate movement in that case because there's a hot spot over it. But there's mountain ranges. Um, there's mountain ranges wherever you have spreading zones, like in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, out in the Indian Ocean, places like that. Uh, those ridges, the Atlantic Ridge is kind of neat because that oceanic ridge actually comes to the surface in Iceland. And you have these igneous rocks exposed to the surface, which makes it, Iceland this really hot spot for studying uh, geology, especially spreading zone geology. And there's places where you can go and, and, and you can be on either, there's a bridge across there and you can be on either one of the different uh, tectonic plates by walking across the bridge. It's kind of neat. So, but yeah, we, we look at oceanic ridges too when we look at plate tectonic theory. So here, of course, is the the map and some things I've talked about here, like the Emperor Sea Chain, which helps us date the, the movement of the Pacific Ocean. So there's a uh, chain of sea mounts. Uh, here we've got Iceland, which of course is right in the middle of that Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Atlantic Ridge runs right through here. We call that the Mid-Atlantic Rise. Um, here's all your different continental margins. So you can see the face of the earth is a pretty rugged place. You've probably seen this map before. Uh, basically, we can take the actual uh, different parts of the planet and we can break them into what we call mountain belts. And those are the places that, you know, are the most prominent features, like it says, on Earth's surface. Um, and there's lots of different mountain belts. The big ones are the Rocky Mountain Cordillera, the Himalayan Cordillera. We tend to call them Cordillos because it's chains of mountains. Uh, you've got the East African Rift Valley Mountain Belt. Um, the Appalachians, which are a pretty old mountain belt, which also include Europe. The stable interiors of continents we call Cratons or Cratons. I always say Cratons. Different people say it different. Cratons. I've heard it say Craton, but I say Craton. A shield basically is a huge expanse of a Craton or a Craton that is exposed. So you have this uh, crystalline rock that is usually metamorphic because of heat and pressure. So it's like you've dug up the foundation of the continents, you've moved away all of the different material that's on top of sedimentary rocks, and here's a shield. When you get up into Canada, we have a massive expanse of this rock that the Canadians call the 
well, we call it the Canadian Shield, kind of like we call bacon Canadian bacon. But when you're up in Canada, the Canadians call it the Precambrian Shield, which is actually the right name for it when you think about it, because it's Precambrian in age. Um, we actually live in what's called the stable platform. So we're right in the middle of a continent, but we're not living on a shield. The shield rock for us is about, oh, the basement shield rock. To get to it here, you're looking at tens, tens of thousands of feet to get down to the shield rock because we have all these different sedimentary layers below us. So we live on what's called a stable platform. When you get up into Canada, all those sedimentary layers have been carved away by glaciers. So then you're living, you know, if you're up in northern Saskatchewan or Manitoba, now you're in the shield. In other words, the rock, the basement of the continent is right at the surface. And you can see that right here. Uh, the gray is your stable platforms in every continent. And you can see we live roughly like right in here. So we live on a stable platform, a continent. Like so you go a little, a little farther north, we got this massive chunk of the craton called the Canadian Shield. You can see there's one in Brazil, or I should say Greenland. There's a Brazilian one. The African Shield is massive. Uh, there's one up here in the northern parts of Europe. You can see Indians got basically mostly shield rock, Australia. And then there's a little tiny piece over here in the middle of uh, Russia, Siberia, exactly. So here's basically your three different types of things. The Canadian Shield, which is at the surface. It's all those nasty basement rocks that are exposed because of glaciers. Here's a mountain belt. This is the Appalachians. It's a bunch of folded and upturned rock that's at the surface. And here you've got a young mountain belt, which in this case is the Himalayas. It's one of the youngest mountain belts in the world. So you can see them color-coded here, old mountain belts, young mountain belts, shields, uh, stable platforms, so on and so forth. That's the end of chapter one. That means we're ready for a vocabulary quiz. I think for chapter one, we'll just give you a vocabulary quiz, and then we're just going to move on into chapter two, which is plate tectonic theory. So thanks for listening. There'll be questions down in the description for this video. Make sure you have them done on time. Otherwise, it's a 10% deduction. It won't be hard. Just watch it and answer the questions.